So to start with, I think in your book, you say quite explicitly that you can get through an entire undergraduate major in psychology without ever hearing Freud's name. So just to start with, what is his relationship then to contemporary psychology as it's done at a department like Yale or Toronto? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just to sort of place myself. I'm among psychologists rather Freud friendly. Mm-hmm. I, I give a lecture in my class. I have a chapter. I say some nice things about him. The mainstream view, and I'm very critical of him. The mainstream view in psychology is 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 more critical. It is um, Eocene is an embarrassment. Eocene is an embarrassment, and and that the idea is that just about everything he said, every specific claim he made about uh, the oral stage, the anal stage, the primal scene. The Oedipus complex, penis envy, hysteria, repression, uh, you know, defense mechanism, everything is bo- is nonsense. It's just nonsense. Should be be jettisoned. Um, and that uh, there's nothing to be said uh, good about him. He was a, you know, on a personal level, he was a fraud, a charlatan, a liar. But as a scientist, uh, he was just deeply mistaken about what matters the most. So that's the sort of party line among my colleagues. Like, you know, if, if you, um, if you, if you listen to like a lecture on, on, um, on anything having to do with clinical psychology and you sort of sat in back and said, well, you know, what would Freud say about this? You know, people would roll their eyes and you know, before we get into Lacan or whatever, who I don't think anybody would have heard of. And there's enormous discussion of Freud in the university, but in, you know, in English departments, in, in, um, in, in departments in the humanities. So that's the negative rap on Freud, which I think is fundamentally right. On the other hand, I think Freud got some things, got some really important things uh, right. Um, one is, I think the main one is the importance of the unconscious. The idea that there's unconscious processes govern how we think and uh, the, the, our emotion, our emotional responses to things, many of our choices. Um, an example I'd like to give is, suppose you're a political psychologist. And you want to know, political psychologists want to know this, um, they want to know why some people voted for Trump and others voted for Biden. And so you might think, well, just ask people. And when people could lie to you, but just ask people. Ask them quietly, so tell them, don't lie, tell me the truth. And nobody would do that. Why? Because, because psychologists understand that often you might not know why you voted for Biden or you voted for Trump. You might think it's for one reason, but it's for another reason. In other words, political psychologists appreciate that you could be governed by, by factors, your behavior could be governed by factors beyond your control. And I think there's a great debt to Freud we have here, um, where maybe all the specifics are wrong, but I think in his core idea, he gets credit. Hmm. Well, you said that he's seen as an embarrassment because everything he said is nonsense. I think your word was should be jettisoned or has been jettisoned. Yeah. But then on the other hand, I know that Karl Popper thought so much of psychoanalysis is unfalsifiable and that it's yeah. not even science. And so I'm trying to uh, make these two, reconcile these two views yes. where one, we can we can jettison all of this, but then on the other hand, we can't even test it. So what is there to be uh, just jettisoned? Yeah, it, it it has the flavor of such awful food and such small portions too, <laughs> where you know you can't you can't you, you know I don't want to argue. Um, well, it's all unfalsifiable, you know. Popper's critique and later uh, Adolf Grunbaum expanded his critique. It's, it's all unf- in other words, uh, Freud could explain everything. Mm-hmm. No matter what you do, no matter what happens, Freud has an explanation for it. And kind of when you explain everything, you explain nothing. When 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 your theory can account for anything, cannot be proven false. It's not science anymore. It's akin to astrology. That's one critique. A second critique is that it's wrong. <laughs> it's just it's just been proven wrong. Well, they both can't be right. So so let me let me say the I think the proper formulation, which is in the hands of Freud and the Freudians, the theory often was unfalsifiable. In that um in that no matter what happened, they could give an explanation for it. And it loses scientific interest. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could say, okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to be like Freud and the Freudians. We're going to take these theories seriously. 
So Freud said one of his claims, just toss out a kind of claim at random, saying that um, that um, uh, uh, some if if you have problems with toilet training, you'll be fixated to anal stage, and then as an adult, you'd be more prone to have an anal personality where you're say very very picky and very precise and very neat. That's one of the claims. He said that you know a boy who loses his father early in life will become homosexual because blah blah blah. And I have a story about it. Now, Freud could wiggle out of all it, but let's say, let's not wiggle out. Let's actually test these claims. And it turns out whenever you try to test them, look for relating to toilet training and personality, death of a parent and sexuality, it just doesn't turn out to be true. Hmm. Is that a way of sort of threading the needle, getting getting to no, sort of complain no, about both of the things? That that's quite helpful. I think that I, I heard this on your quite brilliant podcast with David Pizarro. I've listened to every episode so far. Uh, it really is. Oh. It really is great. But Oh, thank you. Thank you. Dave, David gets so much of the credit. He's this a uh, really sharp guy. And also he's, he's a, just this natural, well, sound like, sound like a, like a backhanded insult, but a natural podcaster. And he's very sort of charming and easy to talk to. Yeah. But, he's, he's quite good. Uh, uh, parenthetically, I'll be, I'll be reaching out to him soon, but I think it was, I think it was on this podcast that you said you two were recounting a story in which, well, a few minutes ago, you said that his theories were unfalsifiable in the hands of Freud and his disciples. And this story that you related in the podcast, I believe, was that Freud was having some exchange with one of these disciples and the disciple disagreed with Freud's theory. And Freud's response was that he's just, it's just like, he's attacking his father. He wants to kill his father or something like, so he just sort of shifts the goalposts and changes the, changes the subject. Yeah, it's 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 a move which you guys, is almost dazzling in its rhetorical creativity, which is even contemporary Freudians and people of his school would often respond to criticisms by saying the critic is mentally ill, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, uh, and and basically, I think one one of the stories that that Freud that that David and I talked about. Um, was uh, Freud had a dream, uh, did a, this wonderful dream interpretation, and this woman dreamt about her um, uh, that, that she was wearing this hat of a certain shape, and uh, and, and so, so Freud immediately analogized the hat to a penis, even though it didn't seem very penis shaped, and 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 he goes on and tells this quite interesting and fascinating interpretation. But there's nothing in the world that could prove him wrong. In fact, if the woman protested and said that's a terrible interpretation, that's total nonsense. Any good Freudian would say, I, I've really touched a nerve here. I must be at the, coming at the truth. Hmm. So, uh, Dreams are actually something that I wanted to touch on briefly. After I say this, you'll know that I've been making my round listening to all sorts of podcasts. But I was listening to Matthew Walker's of, of Berkeley's podcast on sleep. And he did a series on dreams. And I think, and this was a couple of months ago, so now I, I don't want to be dangerously misquoting him but i think he said that freud got a lot wrong and he set psychology of of dreams back a long way because things because his claims couldn't be uh, falsified the way that he would interpret dreams and i'm wondering what the relationship between freud's theories on dreams is to contemporary psychology's theories on dreams because just because you mentioned that contemporary psychology retains his views to some degree yeah. on the unconscious. And I think of the unconscious as playing a very big role in our dreams, at least trivially because we're unconscious when we have them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Freud's work in dream interpretation picked up from a long tradition that ran, you know, long before Freud, people were interpreting dreams in different ways and he, he turned it into, a very rich enterprise. And, you know, again, to give, to give points to Freud, he's at times a brilliant, beautiful writer. Um, if, if you sort of don't care about whether or not he gets it right, reading chunks of the interpretation of dreams could be like, like a joy. Um, but I don't think a lot of Freud's specific claims about dreams, which often turn around wish fulfillment. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but he, he thinks for the most part, dreams are wish fulfillment. And I don't think anybody believes that anymore. Um, I don't. I, I haven't kept up with the state of the art on what people think about dreams. I know many psychologists 
would tell you dreams don't have the meanings that we uh, that that we attribute to them. They they aren't just some sort of royal road to the unconscious. Plainly, the dreams you have connect to what's happened to you during the day, so called a day residue. I think is a Freud a Freudian term, and connects to what you're interested in, your desires, and so on. But I think a lot of psychology is skeptical about saying we can learn that much about you by listening to your dreams. Well, I mentioned that I was going to be speaking to some psychoanalysts in the near future. One of them is Mark Solms of of Cape Town, yeah. who does a lot of work on dreaming. And as I understand it, at this nascent point in my uh, preparation as, and research, he's very concerned with tying important tenets of psychoanalytic theory to their neurological correlates. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be a really interesting conversation when it comes around. Yeah. I, th I think, I, you know, Freud had a lot of brilliant things to say, and it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Some strands of his ideas turned out to motivate active research programs and turned out to be right or turned out to capture some insight. I give some examples in my book of a few things I think he did get, get right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know his work at all. I think that, that I would be underwhelmed if it turned out, if somebody came to you and sort of said, well, let me tell you stories. I had this, this client came to me and she had this dream and I interpreted it and I was right. Well, you know, humans are really good storytellers. But if, if, you know, if somebody says we did this controlled study with a hundred people and we found that this kind of dream correlated with this and so on, that becomes more interesting. Mm -hmm. And returning again to something you said at the outset of your response that, Freud isn't really given credit for his discovery of the unconscious and that, I mean, we don't hear his name invoked in the yeah. Toronto psychology department. Is this the product of some historical or sociological development in psychology over the past hundred years, or is it just an accident of some sort? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I think psychologists as a whole aren't very history minded, mm -hmm. so we um, that makes sense. We we you know we just so I know a lot of social, social psychologists who believe the unconscious is extremely powerful in terms of to social impression. They never talk about Freud. They talk about the work of their advisor or other social psychologists. We just don't look that back that far. Mm 